This book takes on the topic of terrorism. And terrorism is a word that has uh, enormous valence in the modern world. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that wasn't used 50 or 100 years ago very often. Um, it has come to be much, much more important. Uh, and it's come to be a weapon uh, in ideological battles and battles for the control over discourse. Um, and one of the things that this book tries to do is to show how the kinds of tactics that have been described as terrorism in the last few decades, in fact, were central to the establishment of the State of Israel. But I want to draw your attention to the discursive aspect of this. Um, what is terrorism? Uh, he here describes a number of actions directed against the British colonial authorities, um, which I personally would not describe as terrorism. I would describe an attack by a population in a colonial setting on the officials or the, or the military uh, of the colonial power in, a different, in different terms. Um, and I, but I would describe attacks on civilians, uh, anybody, any civilians, by any actor as terrorism, myself. There aren't agreed definitions of this. And as you will notice if you pay any attention to American political discourse, this is a highly selective term. It's used to describe states that do certain kinds of things and is rigorously avoided in describing other states which do the exact same things, such as using chemical weapons against their own population, such as uh, uh, using or using chemical weapons on the battle. So this is a word with, a, with enormous valence, with enormous uh, uh, emotional freight attached to it. Um, and I, I think there is actually a legitimate use for the term. But I think that it has to be very rigorously thought about um, when it is used. So I personally would describe any attack on civilians as terrorists, but I would not describe attacks on the forces of, a, of an occupying power uh, or military forces in a civil war as terrorism. The means may be reprehensible and horrific, um, but they deserve a different kind of terminology. With those introductory remarks, let me hand over to Tom, who will talk for about 40, 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Please, Tom. Thank you. Thank you so much. My thanks to Simone, Helen, Professor Collady, and everyone else who made this meeting possible. Fifty years ago, fifty years ago, I was a student at the Juilliard School of Music, which in those days was right your neighbors, right on the other side of 122nd Street. At the time, I and some of my fellow students were active in the movement to end the war against Vietnam. At the time, I never could have foreseen that a half century later, I would be on this side of the street talking about another colonial war of aggression for which the United States is also principally responsible, the war against Palestine, the so-called Israel-Palestine conflict, though conflict's really a misnomer. As with Vietnam, Ending the injustice against Israel-Palestine means confronting an entrenched mythology that secures the tacit consent of the public. And this is the angle that I will try to address. We are all familiar with the conflict's beginnings in the in late 19th century Europe, in the climate of emerging ethnic nationalism, a movement takes hold to establish a Jewish state in response to anti-Semitism in Europe and Russia. At the time, Many saw this as a capitulation to bigotry and a forfeiting of the long struggle for equality. Many Jews resented the movement's treatment of them as a race apart. They resented the idea that they should now make yet another ghetto, and worse yet, to make it on other people's land. But for others, it did offer the promise of an escape from persecution. Messianic fundamentalism would become the driving engine of the movement, both to posit the settler state as an indigenous movement and to inspire Jews to people it, because there was a wide disinterest in the project among Jews. And so there was only one possible target for the project, Palestine, because it was the land of the biblical Jewish kingdom. Other locations were considered, but only as stepping stones if necessary. Fast forward to today, and whereas all the other European ethnic nationalist movements have long since failed, this one, Zionism, lives on as the so-called Israel-Palestine conflict. <coughs> one need not question the motivation of any individual involved with Zionism's beginnings to point out that ultimately the settler state itself became the goal. Anti-Semitism and persecuted Jews became the means to that goal. <coughs> 
The racialized nature of this settler movement has been the cause of more than a century of misery, displacement, and death. And it is, arguably, the epicenter of the destabilization of the Middle East as a whole. Yet, we have all been conditioned to think of an end to this conflict as almost a fantasy. We are led to believe that it is so complicated as to be virtually unsolvable. But this mindset is itself much of the problem. It has conditioned the public to accept this tragedy as self-perpetuating. The conflict is, in truth, remarkably simple. An ethnic nationalist movement seeks to establish a settler state on other people's land. The people resist. That's the conflict. Everything else is just the details. And today's instant global communications makes this more blatant than ever. The never-ending theft of land, the never-ending ethnic cleansing, repression, siege, dehumanization, and these punctuated by major terror attacks. Protective Edge, Kaslan, Sovereign Shatila, Kibya, decide just a few of these. And most of the victims in these attacks were already refugees, victims of the settler movement's ethnic cleansing. The human toll of Protective Edge alone, that was the attacks against Gaza July 2014, was roughly equivalent to the 9-11 terror attacks. About 20% fewer people died in Protective Edge, whereas there were about twice the total casualties, including 1,000 children left permanently disabled. And to keep the comparison accurate, imagine if the terrorists of 9-11 had destroyed vital infrastructure upon which the health of the entire population depended and then been able to block us from rebuilding it. But we are told, as we have been since the siege of Gaza began in 1948, not 2006 with the election of Hamas, but in 1948, that Israel was acting in self-defense. The conflict could end tomorrow if our own governments, the United States and the various European countries, stop enabling it. And lest this claim sound exa exaggerated, just imagine for the moment how the international community would react if the ethnicities in this conflict were reversed. Think about that. It really would end tomorrow. So, ending the conflict, in my view, requires deconstructing and exposing the mechanism that maintains this complete inversion of reality. And that is Israel's creation myth, its autobiography, its self-identity. Israel spins itself as not merely a political entity like any other nation state, but as the rebirth of the Old Testament kingdom, whose name Zionist leaders adopted for that strategic purpose, striking a powerful chord in the collective Western subconscious. This messianic narrative had to be made inseparable from the nation state, and to accomplish this, Israel encapsulated it into the, the seemingly innocent term, the Jewish state. But Israel uses this term as a human shield, hiding behind it to insulate itself from accountability. This self-identity as the Jewish state, not a Jewish state, but the Jewish state, is altogether unlike any other country's relationship with any other religion or cultural group. Judaism is not Israel's state religion in the sense of a national faith that any nation might adopt. Rather, Israel presents itself as the very embodiment of Jewry, of Judaism, Jewish history, culture, and persecution. And it is to assert this implicit ownership over all Jewry that Israel refuses to allow Israeli nationality. By Israeli law, the nationality of Jewish citizens of Israel is Jewish, and repeated legal challenges to this abuse have all failed. Any acknowledgment that a Jewish individual might be free of an intrinsic obligatory connection to Israel would undermine its pretense as the common destiny of Jews simply because they are Jews. Zionism freed nationalism from the constraints of geographic borders, making ethnicity itself the frontier. Nationalism and what Zionist leaders considered to be the Jewish race were made one and the same in the service of the settler state. Thus Israel, taken at its word, makes Jews, simply by virtue of being Jews, partner to whatever it does, and the profound anti-Semitism of that is self-evident. Israel's defenders are now flaunting the line that Zionism is Jewish self-determination. We hear this all the time now. No. It is exactly the opposite. It is the theft of Jewish individual self-identity and self-determination and the enslavement of that self-determination to a racist neo-colonial settler project. Zionism as a political movement might have survived as nothing more than an odd footnote in history 
had Britain, for its own geopolitical reasons, not taken up its cause. We are now, of course, in the centennial of Britain's original sin in, in this tragedy, the Balfour Declaration. What is clear in British source documents is that Balfour and the other officials involved knew, knew all along, that the Zionists intended to seize all of Palestine and expel non-Jews from it. Behind the scenes, activists like Hein Weizmann and Baron Rothschild were demanding the entire region for a Zionist state, treated the ethnic cleansing of non-Jewish Palestinians as indispensable to their plans, and insisted that the British lie about the scheme until it is too late for anyone to do anything about it. In correspondence with Balfour, Weizmann justified his lies with racist slurs against the Palestinians and against non-Zionist Jews, and especially the Middle East indigenous Jews, who were overwhelmingly opposed to the Zionist project and whom Weizmann smeared with classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. The Palestinians, the Palestinians he dismissed as, in so many, so many words, a lower type of human. And this was among the reasons he and other Zionist leaders used for refusing simple democracy in Palestine. If the Arabs, the Palestinians, had the vote, he said, it would lower the Jew down to the level of a native, his word. And, and speaking of the choice of words, the ability of language to spark across and bypass rational thought and instead tell us what to think, rather than simply communicate, has always been especially important in this issue. And so it was with the major buzzword during the British Mandate, Jewish immigration. What's wrong with Jewish immigration? Why would anyone be against Jewish immigration? But we have to keep in mind that Zionist immigration was not immigration the way we normally think of the word. It was rather the extranationalization of the land. By the 1920s, four decades of Palestinian protest against their dispossession of land, labor, and resources had proved futile, and the late 1920s brought the first of two Palestinian uprisings. Palestinian terrorists were loosely knit groups operating outside the Palestinian villages. In contrast, Zionist terror organizations operated from within the settlements and were actively empowered and shielded by those settlements and by the Jewish agency, the recognized semi-autonomous ruling body of the settlements what would become the Israeli government. And whereas the Palestinian villages did help to some extent in ending Palestinian terror, the Zionist settlements were party to the terrorism, shielded and funded the terrorists, and steadfastly refused any cooperation in stopping the terror. Now, there were, of course, many among the Jewish settlements who were horrified at the terrorism. But if they became vocal, they would, for example, find their cars blown up while well, those who became more actively opposed were not so lucky. Three major terror organizations dominated Palestine during these years and attacked anyone in their way, Palestinian, Jew, or British. The Haganah, formed in 1920 and in large part trained by the British, was said to be a defensive militia, though within a few years it was already assassinating Jews who challenged Zionism. And the pretense that it was defensive would become unsustainable by the 1940s. Its offshoot, the Irgun, was formed in 1931 to engage in more indiscriminate terror, and the Irgun's offshoot, Lehi, better known as the Stern Gang after its first leader, was formed in late 1940 by Irgun members who saw no difference between the Allied powers and the Axis powers, and therefore saw no reason to moderate their terror during World War II. The Haganah and the Irgun toned down their terror for a while, but in late 1942, Irgun head and future Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin judged that, contrary to what he had earlier thought, an Allied victory would not necessarily guarantee a Zionist state. And so, halfway through World War II, the Irgun abandoned restraint and the Haganah soon followed suit. The Jewish agency often cooperated and collaborated with the Irgun and Lehi and even helped finance the Irgun. It would condemn Irgun and, his, and Lehi terror, but this was usually cosmetic. With rare exception, it steadfastly refused any help in ending it. A British analysis was that the Hakana would let the Irgun in particular carry out terror attacks so that the Jewish agency could feign innocence. By 1947, even the superficial differences vanished. The Jewish agency tolerated little dissent and sought to dictate the fates of all Jews, and so the indoctrination of Jewish children was vital to the Zionist project. The first time I am aware of this coming to wide public light was on the 
8th of July, 1938. That day, the Irgun blew up a bus filled with Palestinian villagers. Now, this was not the first time the Irgun had done something of this sort, but this time the British caught the alleged bomber. She was a 12-year-old schoolgirl, apparently egged on by three adults. Jewish teenagers, both boys and girls, were commonly used to carry out terror attacks, and this continued throughout to the ethnic cleansing of 1948. For example, when shortly before the, par the partition resolution of November 1947, the British uncovered a Lehi terror school, many of the inductees were, to quote the British, children of tender years, both boys and girls. Adolescents of both sexes were among the terror militia that massacred the village of Deir Yassin several months later. Deir Yassin being the best known, but merely one of many such massacres. Teachers were threatened or removed if they tried to intervene in the indoctrination of their students, and the students themselves were blocked from advancement if they resisted. Jews who opposed and tried to warn of the emerging Zionist fascism were assassinated. And indeed, most victims of Zionist assassination, that is a specifically targeted individual rather than, than indiscriminate murder, were Jews. Palestinian armed resistance ended before the outbreak of World War II. Through to late 1947, there were virtually no Palestinian attacks. As Zionist terror ravaged Palestine and brought the country to its knees, Palestinians maintained stoic nonviolence. A British explanation for the Palestinians' refusal to respond in kind was that they understood that the attacks were a trap intended to elicit blowback that the Zionists would frame as a threat against which they would have to defend themselves. This was the tactic used to ignite the civil war of 1948 that the Zionists needed. And it, of course, remains Israel's principal strategy today. Terrorize until there is a reaction, then use that reaction to justify whatever it wishes to do. Protective edge, cast lead, etc. To be treated as most secret is, is the red ink heading of the transcript of a key meeting of 20 people, including top Zionist leaders, held in London on the 9th of September 1941, setting the direction for Palestine's future. It is worth summarizing because it is typical of what went on behind the scenes, and it is an almost comical laying bare of the hypocrisy of Zionist, now Israeli, claims of democracy and equal rights. Indeed, the conversation sounds like it anticipates George Orwell's then still to be written political satire, Animal Farm. Present were Weizmann, who had called the meeting, David Ben Gurion, and other Zionist leaders such as Simon Marks of Marks and Spencer, and the prominent non Zionist industrialist Robert Whaley Cohen. There is nothing left to the imagination. The takeover and ethnic cleansing of all of Palestine remained the plan. Anthony Rothschild began by stressing that there would be no discrimination against any group of its citizens in the Jewish state. Weizmann and Ben-Gurion also assured the skeptics. Arabs, Palestinians, would have equal rights. However, they clarified that within that absolute equality, Jewish settlers would have to have special privileges. And so Weizmann's, quote, absolute equality required the transfer of most non-Jews out of Palestine while permitting, quote, a certain percentage of Arab and other elements, whatever other elements, as he doesn't explain, to remain in his Jewish state, the insinuation being as a pool of cheap labor. Rothschild's vision of equality and non-discrimination was equally compelling. It, quote, depended on turning an Arab majority into a minority. And to achieve this, there would be, quote, no equal rights for non-Jews. Cohen, the industrialist, found the scheme terrifying. He submitted that the Zionists were, and I quote him, starting with the kind of aims with which Hitler had started. He proposed that the state not be predicated on race, that it not be predicated on religion, and that it be named with a neutral geographic term. He proposed that the state should be named Palestine. The others were horrified at this idea, arguing that if the state did not have a Jewish name, quote, they would never get a Jewish majority, acknowledging the use of messianic fundamentalism as a political strategy for the settler state. In another obvious but never publicly spoken admission, Ben-Gurion clarified that his Jewish state was not based on Judaism. It was rather based on Jews as a race, which until Zionism had been classic anti-Semitism. 
Weizmann further proposed taking Transjordan along with Palestine, and at the end of the meeting, he sought to put his proposals into effect in the name of all Jews. Those against his proposals were, in his word, anti-Semites. As they were discussing the occupation and ethnic cleansing of Palestine, a war against occupation and ethnic cleansing was raging, World War II. What was the Jewish agency's reaction to the most terrible enemy Jewry has ever known? From the beginning, it was to encourage the Yishar, the Jewish settlers, not, not to enlist in the Allied struggle against the Nazis until it was under circumstances that would further Zionism, which did not happen until the last year of the war with the so-called Jewish Brigade, an inefficient encumbrance on the Allies whose purpose was to further Zionist goals. It was to conduct a theft ring of Allied weapons and munitions, as if, as one British military record put it, as if paid by Hitler himself. It was to continue its violence in Palestine, taking resources and personnel away from the war effort. It was to run a vast program of what were euphemistically called hiking parties or walking tours, surveillance operations throughout Palestine to gather meticulous, comprehensive data about the Palestinian villages and villagers they would erase when the opportunity came. And it was to take advantage of the Allies' war exhaustion. Ben-Gurion had long planned to exploit the Allies' end-of-war weakness to his strategic advantage, and so by 1944, the Haganah began ratcheting up its terror. Desperate, the British mounted a public plea to the Isha of explaining that their terror was making the struggle against the Nazis all the more difficult. I'll read a few excerpts from it. Palestine has enjoyed five years of virtual immunity from the horrors of war, but has been the scene of a series of outrageous crimes of violence by Jewish terrorists to force their political aims. These events are proceeding side by side with the bitterest phase of the critical fighting between the United Nations, that is the Allied forces, and Nazi Germany. The plea was ignored and the terror increased, and it was in the fateful year of 1945, with Truman ascending to the presidency after Roosevelt's death and the end of the war, that Ben-Gurion turns his attention to Washington instead of London. The United States, he judged then, would now serve Zionism better than Britain. The exploitation of the war continued after the Allied victory, when the Jewish agencies talked to exploit the fact that Britain's struggle against the Nazis had brought it to economic ruin. There was a move to pressure the United States not to approve its post-war loan to Britain unless Britain acceded to Zionist demands. Much has been written on the collaboration between the Zionists and the fascists during the war, the, the best known, of course, being the Havara transfer agreement that broke the anti-Nazi boycott. One of the lesser known was Lehi's attempted collaboration with the Italian fascists. In its nearly concluded Jerusalem agreement of late 1940, Lehi offered to support a fascist victory in the war, in exchange for which the Italian fascists would use their military power to forcibly uproot Jewish communities and move their populations to Palestine. If this sounds like a scheme so extreme that only fanatical Lehi could have conjured it, it is essentially what the Israeli state ultimately succeeded at in the early 1950s, most catastrophically when it conducted a false flag terror campaign against Jews in Iraq to destroy that ancient community and move its population to Israel as ethnic fodder. Many German Jewish immigrants to Palestine during the war were outraged by the Zionist exploitation of the Nazi horrors they had just fled. This outrage was given voice by, among others, the prominent journalist Robert Felch, who had been editor of a Berlin newspaper until that paper was banned by the Nazis in 1938. Welch warned that Zionist leaders, quote, have not yet understood that the enemy seeks the destruction of the Jews. We who have been here only a few years, we know what Nazism is. Zionists rather are, quote, taking part in the crash of European Jewry only as spectators, now I paraphrase, fighting the British and keeping Jews from joining the Allied struggle while getting comfortable and rich from their political project in Palestine. Recent immigrants from Germany and Central Europe, he said, have no representation among the Zionist ruling establishment. If they did, quote, we would have demanded that the Yishev should put itself at the disposal of Britain for the fight against Hitler and Nazism. But, and I am still quoting him, 
They do not want to fight against Hitler because his fascist methods are also theirs. They do not want our young men to join the forces, the Allied forces. Day after day, they are sabotaging the English war effort. These German Jewish immigrants were shunned by the Zionists, their publications and presses bombed. Even kiosks were bombed by the Zionists for selling non-Hebrew papers to German Jewish immigrants. In 1943, a man whom British records describe as, quote, a Jew whose integrity is not open to question, risked his life to warn about the threat of Zionism. For his safety, he was referred to only by the code name Z. Z described Zionism as a parallel movement to Nazism. He warned that the Zionist indoctrination of Jewish youth was producing a society of extremists who will use any method necessary to achieve Zionist goals. And he pointed out that as fascism in Europe has demonstrated, such a society is very difficult to undo once it has taken root. How trustworthy is this anonymous testimony? Well, I found at Britain's National Archives a private letter in which Z is identified. He was J.S. Bentwich, Senior Inspector of Jewish Schools in Palestine. A report by U.S. intelligence in the Middle East, dated the 4th of June, 1943, was entitled, Latest Aspects of the Palestine Zionist Arab Problem. Not the Jewish Arab problem, the Zionist one. The report described Zionism in Palestine as a type of nationalism, which in any other country would be stigmatized as retrograde Nazism, and stated that anti-Semitism was essential to it. Whereas assimilated Jews in Europe and America are noted for being stout opponents of racialism and discrimination, Zionism has bred the opposite mentality. The report refuted Zionist propaganda about having made the desert bloom. It noted the irony that it was from the Palestinians that the settlers learned, among many other things, the cultivation of the Yaffa oranges. And whereas the Palestinians were self-sufficient, the Zionist settlements exist only on massive external financing. And should the settlements ever have to survive on their own merits, as the Palestinians do, quote, the venture will collapse like a pricked balloon. The conclusion of this early US intelligence report was, however, naive, or at least it was premature. Now that the world, quote, has seen the lengths to which the Nazi creed has carried the nations, it reasoned that the Zionists, quote, are due to find themselves an anachronism. I'd like to say a quick word about all these Nazi-Zionist parallels, which continued with the behavior of the early Israeli state. For me, unless there is some specific historical reason for doing so, I do not make the parallel, in part because it's a distraction. But more so, I object to the idea that we need to be jarred by the word Nazi and its reference to European suffering in order to acknowledge that generations of people in Palestine, in the many refugee camps, and indeed within Israel, have been robbed of normal lives so that a privileged race can usurp and rule. Zionism has sought to reduce an entire people to subhumans. That is the reality. In the cause of Zionism, Gaza has been reduced to a laboratory for sadism and weapons proving. That is the reality right in front of our eyes. If we need the word Nazism to see it, it, it is because we are not seeing others as equals. The most deadly terror attack of the entire mandate period provides a good illustration of the Jewish agency's priorities regarding persecuted Jews versus its settler project. This most deadly bombing was not the bombing of the King David Hotel in 1946, as is commonly thought. Even some of the Irgun's bombings of Palestinian markets killed more people than died in the King David Hotel bombing. But the single most deadly attack was the Jewish agency's bombing of the immigrant ship Patria in 1940, killing an estimated 267 people, most of whom were Jews fleeing the Nazis. The Jewish agency bombed the Patria because it was bringing the DPs to Mauritius, where they would be safe from the war and where the British had facilities for them. But the Zionist settler project needed them in Palestine. So the Zionist version of history is that the Jewish agency meant only to disable the ship. Well, of course it meant only to disable the ship, but this is an absurd argument. When you blow up a ship, you cannot say that you didn't mean to hurt anybody. The fact is that the agency placed Zionism its need for ethnically correct settlers above the lives of the people. In further violence against its Jewish victims, the agency framed them for its crime and exploited them for propaganda. 
it spread the lie that the DPs themselves blew up the vessel, that they committed mass suicide because they could not bear not to go directly to Palestine, posthumously exploiting the very people they had killed to serve the Zionist narrative. Nor was this the only immigrant ship the Jewish agency bombed for its political reasons. The bombing of the Empire lifeguard seven years later lacked even the patria's disingenuous justification. That vessel was bringing Jewish TPs to Palestine for permanent settlement, exactly what the Zionists wanted. But simply as a sneer to the British, since it was a British vessel, the agency had it rigged with a time bomb, risking all aboard to the accuracy of the, of the detonator timer, the fickleness of the seas, and unpredictable maritime delays. The hope, the hope was for the bomb to explode after the DPs were off. As it happened, there were some delays on the seas, and the bomb exploded as the passengers were disembarking. Further mocking the alleged role of the Settler Project as a safe haven for persecuted Jews, the agency would take immigration permits intended for European survivors and give them to Americans and British who were comfortable and at no risk, but who made better settlers. In general, most countries did not open their doors to the, to the DPs as they should have, the United States among them. And this is cited as a principal reason why Zionists sought to increase Jewish immigration to Palestine. What is also clear, however, is that most Zionist leaders wanted it that way. They did not want Jews to have any option but Palestine. The settler project needed them, and that was the overriding consideration, not the welfare of the war's survivors. As but one example, in early 1944, President Roosevelt succeeded in principle in establishing a half million new homes for European DPs, more than half of these homes in the United States and Britain. U.S. Zionist leaders were outraged and sabotaged it. When Roosevelt's aide, Morris Ernst, confronted U.S. Zionist leaders in an attempt to save the program, he was, in his words, thrown out of parlors and accused of treason. Why treason? Treason because Morris Ernst was Jewish and Zionist claimed to own Jews. As Ernst bitterly put it, the offer of new homes in the United States endangered what he called the Zionist pet thesis, that pet thesis being that Jews must only go to Palestine because they are Jews. Nor were those already settled safe. In 1946, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Palestine, Yitzhak Herzog, went to Europe to forcibly remove orphans of Jewish background from their adoptive European families. Removing 10,000 children from their homes was the number he cited to the New York Times as his goal. In the National Archives in Britain, I found a copy of his record of the trip. In it, Herzog complains of the fierce resistance he met from horrified local Jewish leaders who tried to protect the children, but he used his political clout to circumvent them. In France, for example, facing the steadfast refusal of the Jewish leaders to betray the children, Herzog said, quote, I demanded promulgation of a law which would oblige every family to declare the particulars of the children it houses. Now I paraphrase, so that those of Jewish background could be exposed and shipped to Palestine. To me, this is a Kafkaesque twist on Passover for these children who had just been spared the Nazis. Herzog's justification for the kidnappings was that for a child of Jewish background to be raised in a non-Jewish home is, quote, much worse than physical murder. Yet even this fundamentalist justification fails to explain what was actually taking place, because at the same time Herzog was rescuing Jewish children from this fate much worse than physical murder, his Jewish agency colleagues were sabotaging Jewish adoptive homes in England for young survivors still in the camps. The real reason for all of it, of course, was that the children were needed to serve Zionism as demographic fodder. Um, now I've I am running out of time, so I'm going to skip over quite a bit and and be sure I get to what I need to get to at the end. A few months after the famous immigrant story Exodus, which, which was in itself a story of the abuse of the survivors of war, in November 1947, the UN, violating its own charter, blocked Palestinian self-determination and recommended partition with the implicit creation of a Zionist state. Resolution 181 and the creation of the Israeli state was a direct capitulation to Zionist terrorism, the surrender to the certainty of that terrorism against 
the West. Caving to that terrorism left the Palestinians as the sole victims of that continuing terrorism. The alternate UN plan was for a binational state, which the British believed the Palestinians would have reluctantly supported as a compromise to their desire and absolute right for a democratic state. But this compromise would be, to quote then secret British documents, totally unacceptable to the Zionists, and quote, would therefore be followed by an intensification of Jewish terrorism, that is, yet greater terrorism over that which had already brought Palestine to its knees. The disproportionately large land area the UN gave the Zionists was also in fear of Zionist terrorism. Again quoting British sources, giving the Zionists so much land up front was an attempt to delay, not prevent, but delay the Zionist expansionist wars they knew would come. This appeasement, of course, failed because within a few months of Resolution 181, the Zionist militias were already waging their first expansionist war, confiscating more than half of the Palestinian side of partition. Uh, let me skip ahead. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the fact that the British were occupying Palestine enabled Zionist leaders, in ultimate irony, to juxtapose their war of expropriation and ethnic cleansing as a liberation movement, a war of independence. The armistice that ended the 1948 war established a ceasefire line that, quote, is not to be construed in any sense as a political or territorial boundary. Israel was supposed to return to the agreed partition, but it simply refused. Even if one accepts the legality of partition, the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land began then, not in 1967. Uh, let me skip ahead. Anyway, here we are seven decades later and a century after Balfour. What happens next? How do we fix this instead of forever talking about it? How finally do we bring peace for everybody in the region? Increasingly, it is clear that there is only one possible solution. The solution is what should have happened in 1948, a single democratic secular state of equals. The good news is that thanks to Israel, we're halfway there. The conflict is typically framed in terms of an Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands, with the logical solution being an end to that occupation and presumably the creation of, an, of a Palestinian state. It is high time to acknowledge that this is a fantasy a fantasy kept alive by some to ensure a never-ending bogus peace process. Israel, in its quest to, to finish its business of 1948, has not only discarded partition, which it did 70 years ago, but has also discarded the 1949 armistice line, essentially the so-called 67 borders, and made a single state. Uh, let me skip ahead. The end to the conflict begins when we deprive it of its smoke and mirrors and when we acknowledge that there is a single state. Once this is obvious, who could argue against making it a free state? Who could object to making everyone equal? An end to apartheid, an end to race laws, and in their place, democracy, secularism, and equality. In equa equality as inescapably meaning the unqualified right of return. You can't ethnically cleanse people and then say equality does not apply to you because you're not here. That would be a farce. In closing, a few months after the Castlet attacks, in the spring of 2009, I was in Gaza with a handful of Americans who had slipped in through Egypt. We, want, we went there essentially to bear witness. One day, as we surveyed a scene of total devastation in northern Gaza, an older man appeared from the rubble that had been his family's home. He was holding a live landmine. It was among those that the IDF had used to destroy his family's home, but this one had failed to explode. The man started yelling at us. Fortunately, we had an interpreter. Don't come here and pity me, he yelled. I don't want your pity. I want you to go back to your country and stop your government from doing this to us. Now, while it is certainly important for outsiders to bear wit witness, Nonetheless, he was right. Like the war against Vietnam, the war against Palestine is ultimately our war, being carried out with our money, our political power, our weapons, and our moral capital. Ending it is our moral responsibility. Thank you. Yes. But well, why is it that when you come to the ending, you mention conflict, not the liberation of Palestine from settler colonialism. 
I completely agree with you, and I should change that. I hope I said, I hope I, I meant at least to say at the beginning that conflict was a misnomer. I used it as a convenience. You did say it at the beginning. Uh, but uh, it's probably wrong of me to keep using it e even as a convenience. So I thank you for that. Yeah. Um, why do you balk at the comparison with Nazism? I understand your point that we needn't uh, calibrate uh, the suffering of Palestine by comparison to what happened in Europe. But isn't it if there are deeper issues of just being historically accurate and identifying the kind of movement Zionism is and, and was and its, its grip on attitudes today, Jewish and Gentile as well. I mean, the idea of the Jewish people was dismissed as Jewish rape doctrine by people like Elmer Berger, for instance. He said it was a form of racism. It's a complete uh, contradiction to the liberalism that Jews had subscribed to until well, well into the 20th century. Um, it's, it's not just a matter of, you know, Palestine. It's a question of social attitudes around the world, Jewish and Gentile, and dissolving this claim of the Jewish people on, you know, Jewish identity and also on uh, Gentile concepts of Jewish-Gentile relations. I think... Uh, if I understand your question, correct me if I don't answer the right question, but, but I think it is important to, in terms of the parallels to Nazism. Sure, you can show Zionism as having evolved during that period when there were movements like this. But in terms of pointing out what's happening, I find it offensive that you look at what's going on in Palestine, you look at what's going on in the refugee camps, and, and, and especially in Gaza, it's self-evident. It's, it's like we look at it, and until someone says Nazi, Nazism, oh, it must be bad. If this is like Nazism, oh, it must be bad. Why, it, it, why did we need that? If you, it, it only can mean to me that we're really not acknowledging what's right in front of our eyes until somebody uses the word Nazism, and then it wakes us up. But that's what I object to. I, I agree. I'm more concerned with attitudes outside Palestine attitudes about the claims that Zionism makes on, on Jewish identity and also on Gentile attitudes toward Jews. I mean, it's this concept of the Jewish people, the secularization of Jewishness, which is really the heart of Zionism. Yeah. And those claims are very much alive today in the so-called diaspora, and largely unexamined. The liberalism that Berger represented, for example, has has largely been lost. I mean, the whole tradition of secular radicalism, you know, if they motivate people like Luxembourg, and Maxi Brodin's song and uh, Isaac Deutscher has been lost, I think. So, in other words, you, you think that the, the parallel should be made to expose uh, Zionism as an ethnic nationalist movement? Well, yes. The attitudes that, that dominate uh, Western discussion of Jewish identity and such claims. I mean, there is no such thing as a secular Jew. I mean, that's nonsense. Shlomo Sand says this. Uh, his, his books against the Jewish, the existence of the Jewish people have had zero impact on this country. Yeah. I mean, and that seems to me the nub of the problem and the core of generating any kind of resistance to U.S. policy. Sorry to ramble on. Yeah. Okay. There are other questions? Two, two questions. One is, uh, and maybe you already addressed it, you're putting the issue of Nazism aside, but fascism? Yes. And there's a number, there's a, at least a couple good books, one by an Israeli historian, another one by a Jewish American from, I think, Cincinnati, at least the time the book was written, on the fascist roots of the Likud party, going into extensive detail on Menachem Begin, uh, along with fellows like uh, Netanyahu's father, coming out of that interwar fascist period uh, out of Poland, but retaining those fascist ideas, which would I would argue would be the essence would be ultra militarism, ultra nationalism you know, in the celebration of the martial virtues which you see constantly on display in Israel within the Likud party in the, in the even more radical right parties and unfortunately it's eroding, you know, you know, coming into the United States. We, we have it too, or always have. So I guess that'd be one question, you know, uh, Donald Trump, you know, in spite of the accusations of being anti-Semite and, and Breitbart, you know, same thing. In fact, uh, you know, just a quick search on, on you, uh, on Google finds out that, hey, they're close friends with uh, Netanyahu, but never yet that's never remarked upon here. Instead, we have this straw man of something that that uh, Trump represents something different instead of the close friends that he's made clear he is with Netanyahu and vice versa. So I guess that would be one sort of 
question to maybe comment upon. Mm -hmm. The other one be a martial, military occupation is a form of war. It's just at the lowest level of conflict. So, so you could argue that it's the Israelis who are refusing to make the end of the war, using that as a pretext to continued uh, military oppression, a form of fascism, uh, instead of actually honestly uh, trying to end the war, you know, by some some kind of agreement. So, you know, so it's not really a conflict because it's it's not two sides fighting, but rather it's one side being oppressed, militarily oppressed, just like the Jews were in the Warsaw Ghetto by the other side. So it's not really a war, but rather a exi example of military, pure military oppression, uh, which again is the essence of fascism. Uh, as uh, as far as the... the uh, no, no, go ahead. No, the, the previous question, of, of course, the, um, the, the extreme right has always been sympathetic to Zionism. That's nothing new. Uh, it's not commonly admitted, but one person who was refreshingly honest is there's, there's an Israeli journalist named Yaron London. And after the election of <coughs> Donald Trump, when people were worried about uh, the anti-Semitic uh, elements uh, that, that he would be appointing, he, uh, this Yaron London, he actually came out with an article in the Israeli press in English about how this is good news for Israel because we need a little bit more anti-Semitism in the United States to keep the fire of Zionism alive. Not too much anti-Semitism, but just enough to keep the pressure on. He actually wrote this, and I, but this is what a lot of people feel and don't say. Uh, as far as your other point, well, of course, yes, the, the Israelis never ended the war and uh, their refusal <coughs> to abide by the agreements upon which they were admitted to the United Nations is a complete abrogation of those agreements. They've, uh, if, uh, to this day, they technically, you could say they're not a member of the United Nations. They've never done what they were supposed to do uh, to, uh, to be admitted. Just, just add one final point. So the, the movie, the documentary of about a year ago the, on the settlers, uh, quoted a, had a couple settlers, at least one, talking about how, you know, yeah, they've got Israel now in the West Bank, but their goal remains the same as it was originally under the original fascist leaders, which included uh, Jewish Italians who, you know, were part of the Mussolini government. Uh, but uh, you know, to still uh, take in, you know, on the other side of the Jordan River as well. Right. So again, you can see the pretext that they want to maintain of uh, being in a conflict, uh, so that they can continue with their military conquest. Uh, if you want to be cynical. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that everybody in in uh, Israeli power circles have completely forgotten about the other side of the Jordan. Uh, there has been already talk about th them having to have some sort of a presence on the east side of the Jordan in order to uh, have security on the west side of the Jordan. So I don't think that, I don't think it's going to happen, but I don't think they've forgotten about that idea. And the uh, Zionist justifications for their expansion are often predicated on the idea that they were promised originally this whole area. So as it is, they only have this tiny percentage of what they were supposed to get. Yes. Yes. Uh, Andrew Breitbart uh, went to Israel for a visit, and while he was there, he uh, met with people and and he uh, made a decision that he wanted to do something to help Israel. And he came back and he founded Breitbart News. Uh, and uh, of course, we all know what Breitbart News is about and what kind of uh, program that they've had. Uh, and they continue to have a, a pretty uh, significant influence on the politics of this country, uh, including the promotion of Islamophobia and uh, appeal to the uh, ultra-nationalist uh, right in America. I'm wondering if you have had any occasion to follow this development and uh, how it relates to what your research. The answer, no. No, I, I, I'm perfectly aware of Breitbart News. And I know what you're referring to, but no, I've not followed it and it didn't really relate to what I've been doing, which pretty much ended at the uh, Suez crisis. Okay. I, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, and, and I think a, the activist angle on this is crucial because whenever a comparison between Zionism and Nazism is made, 
Zionism falls short. It's not as terrible as, as, as Nazism is. And then when people hinge their entire analysis or presentation on such a comparison, and the other side proves that it's not so, then everything is okay. Then, then the Zionism gets off the hook. And it's a terrible, terrible, you know, because it's not the same, because it doesn't have to be the same to be attacked. Good. Uh, I have a question, kind of going back to the introduction, um, with the discussion of how do we define terrorism. When you were writing the book methodologically, did you have a, a working definition of terrorism that you were working off of, or how as a writer did you kind of figure out what to put in the book and what, to, what didn't quite make the cut? I, I usually referred to it when I was quoting. I avoided using the word in the first person. As far as my own view of terrorism, uh, I alternated between thinking strictly against civilians, or uh, there are some definitions which include non-combatants. So in other words, a soldier who's in a cafe drinking coffee is a non-combatant. Uh, but I, av I avoided getting involved with the definition I thought would be a distraction. Yes. Sir. So, so just to explain, and I understand the point about you know you don't want to call use the term Nazi, but you know as a Guantanamo defense attorney, I spent the last ten years immersed in studying this. By the way, the soldier in a cafe drinking coffee is a, a legal target under the law of war. It's a, it comes with the status, not not what they're doing at any particular moment. Uh, so, so the other point of it is it gets where, where it gets the nuances and stuff. But so I understand the logic of not wanting to identify Zionism with Nazism because they are two different things, and Nazism so much stands on its own. But Sheldon Wolin, who a Princeton University theorist, and, and I was just looking for it now, the um, former Shin Bet uh, commander, uh, described Israel living a, as a form of uh, incremental tyranny. Now, Sheldon Wolin used the term inverted totalitarianism. Uh, Jacob Talman, in describing the so-called democracies of Eastern Europe back in the 50s, used the term totalitarian democracy. All those terms are much longer than fascism. And like I say, uh, uh, Umberto Eco had an article on ur fascism, which I think he still took it too far. But if you look at it, it's very essence. Uh, and again, not think of the Italian fascist party, which was a separate political party using that term. But what is a term? You know, authoritarianism. Well, that doesn't quite gather everything in, or militarism, well that doesn't quite gather everything in. So the only term that's been used in the last century that fully describes, in my opinion, what it is about military expansionism, ultra-nationalism, the sense of being exceptional or chosen people, about four elements that Mussolini himself said were the essence of fascism, meaning fascism as a political ideology, not as a political party in Italy. So again, until there's a better term or more uh, descriptive term that would apply, and I would apply the same term, fascism, I call it democratic fascism, sort of a takeoff on these others, because we do have elections. But as numerous uh, commentators have written in more and more in the last few years, we've got national security and double government. We've got a deep state, you know, and, and I'm not using Bannon for that authority, I'm using Michael okay. Glennon of Boston University, who wrote a few years ago on national security and double government. And if you look at it, it takes you right back to Ernst Frankel, who wrote in, of Germany, of the Nazis, where he said martial law is a constitutional national socialist Germany in the first sentence. And we have laws now, a law within the United States right now, that provides for military detention totally outside the Constitution. Uh, it was just attempted to be repealed only a week and a half ago, and the effort, effort was turned back. I would argue that that's identical to what Ernst Frankel was describing, although of course the Nazis took it to a far higher level, and we don't know if it'll even be used here in the United States, but it's available. And so as a lawyer, uh, and, and I like to quote a uh, just judge, uh, Judge Prettyman, who always says, you have to look at what can be done with the law, not, not what has been done, or what necessarily will be, but what can be. And we're at a point right now, and I would argue that Israel, from what I understand, is at that same point where you basically have, or Israel basically has, the, the infrastructure, legal, fascist legal infrastructure, just like we have now, with, this, with the idea that we can put a U.S. civilian into military detention merely upon, as the Department of Justice said, the uh, order of the Commander-in-Chief, what we once knew as the President. And that's the essence, I would say, of fascism. Another question. Well, isn't there any, there's no right of habeas corpus in Israel? There hasn't been since, uh, since when? 
In other words, any, any, anybody can be arrested, any Palestinian can be arrested and held without uh, cause, no habeas corpus. So isn't that a definition of um, something awesome? I think of a military dictatorship. The upper nationalism, the military expansionism, the celebration of martial values, martial virtues, meaning, you know, war is, is the ideal state of humanity, you know. That is the essence, as Mussolini said, of the essence of fascism. There's a book about why Israel can't make peace, um, the author, but because of the military establishment and just can't. Well, that would make it eligible to be something like a military dictatorship, and you might be argue that America is in, in that same uh, Question about you personally. Have you come under any criticism for your book? Uh, it, it's, a, it's boring, but uh, so I'll make it brief. But uh, yes, of course, I live in the United Kingdom, and uh, the first really public uh, talk I gave about the book. I gave a small talk at the Catan Foundation in London, the uh, Mosaic Rooms. But then I gave a talk at at SOAS. And at the next day, there were there were the talk was open to the public, and there are these two very well known saboteurs uh, in in London. They were present, and the next day in the um, Daily Mail, a notorious tabloid, which happens to be the most widely read English language news source in the world, but it's this disgusting Because tabloid. of their website. <laughs> because of the naked women on the right side. It's a sidebar. That's the reason it's the most, it's the most, it's the most viewed. I don't most think viewed. most people who actually look at it are literate. Right? <laughs> They're looking at pictures. That's anyway, so, so the next day it, there was a picture of an anti-Semitic hate speaker at major London University. Anyway, this continued on and on. I gave a talk at the House of Lords. A, a very formal complaint was lodged with the House of Lords for allowing an anti-Semitic speaker to be there. There was a whole litany of complaints. I answered this whole litany of complaints. Three months passed and the House of Lords Ethics Committee issued uh, a decision that the complaint was completely foundless, uh, boundless. There was nothing to this complaint. The same people filed a Freedom of Information request about me. I don't know what on earth they were expecting In to find. Britain, is it? Sorry? In Britain? In Britain. I don't know what on earth they were expecting to find, but they didn't find anything. Uh, they most recent, but this went on. This it, it goes on and on. There are all these uh, blogs and everything, uh, which start to border on the uh, on the threatening side of things. Uh, excuse me, I'm I'm now a neo-Nazi. Most recently, I've been uh, grouped with David Irving. It, there was no end to it, and there was a recently about a month ago, they issued a 59-page PDF. Thing, very formal academic thing, scrutinizing this book. They raised funds. They had a fundraising campaign to raise money to allow them to go to the National Archives, which doesn't cost anything, it's free, to spend a summer there going through every one of my citations and trying to find fault. Now, they actually, they found a couple of things. I could have saved them the trouble by pointing to my errata online. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, they, and but, but most, 99% of this was this complete distortion bait and switch and uh, they would they would do things like I would start in the, in the introduction to my book I would mention things that I will be discussing so they would take the introduction and they would take that as the section on this topic and point out that I had no sources for it they did all this manipulation this for this 59 PDF to accuse me of being an academic fraud so yes it's it's still going on I, I have had a few that I know of, there are more that I don't know of, I'm sure, but that I know of, I've had about four talks in the United Kingdom canceled, even with the intervention of PREVENT, which is a British government organization that's supposed to prevent radicalization and terrorism. PREVENT closed down two of my talks. Uh, in a way, the most terrible censorship is the self-censorship, because there are organizations that wanted me to speak, where I had to stop it, because I, it, there's, there's one, uh, I, I won't name them just to keep them out of this, but there's one very, very good, small grassroots organization in London, fabulous. Uh, 
they want to be to speak, but they are very dependent on, on uh, the government funds. And they're always being threatened that this is really a terrorist organization. You have to stop the government funding. But I told them, you know, you can't have me here. The, the work is going to be the kiss of death. So this, there's this self-censorship, which is the most insidious, because there's not even any record of the fact that you've been censored. Right. Prevent is a topic in and of itself. I mean, those, those of you who lament the state of, of rights in this country should see what's happening in Britain and France as far as the discussion of Palestine is concerned. It's actually much worse than here in, 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 in terms of the way in which the law is manipulated. Laws are being manipulated to censor people. Um, you said, uh, Rashid, that uh, the Palestine situation is unique, yes. But isn't the unique part of it the power of a very small part of the population to have so much influence, to have, I mean, what you're describing um, seems to me also part of the uniqueness of the Palestine problem. And what can, what can one do about that? A lot of people wonder why is the United States as committed to this whole project as it is. I've always wondered if, okay, we have the um, arms industry, of course, there's the, there's the um, Christian Zionist lobby, uh, people mention APAC. Okay, if, if when you add all these things up, to me it still falls short. I, it still doesn't explain the degree to which we have involved with, been involved with this since the middle 1940s. And uh, even even in the Eisenhower administration, and he was he was far more reputable about uh, Israel than was Truman. But even with Eisenhower, he would try for a while to to uh, fight them. He would there would be a check ready to go to the Israelis, and then the Israelis would steal aircraft parts from one of our carriers. So and then so they would they would be outraged. Well, why are we paying these people that are stealing parts, our own military parts? But then even people like Benny Morris, arch Zionist, he would say that well, but then the pressure was so great on Eisenhower that he caved in. And the only time that Eisenhower did not cave, and in fact, as far as I can think of, the only time that any president did not cave was when it came to the occupation of the Sinai after the, uh, after the Suez Crisis, where Eisenhower stuck to his guns and eventually Israel had to uh, get out of the Sinai. But uh, to me, if you add up all the reasons we're aware of, and people mention the Jewish folk, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't, I mean, first of all, not all Jews are Zionists, and even if they were, it doesn't explain anything. This is it's a small percentage. It doesn't it, it, demographically. It cannot explain much. So, but it's not nearly as much of an issue as as business and these other interests. But but if you add them all up, I still think it falls short. I don't know. I, 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 I see three questions. I want to say something about this, but let's take the questions and then one, two. I saw another one. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. So. Um, I've been confused about how Zionism got started, but I think that what you were just talking about, I think that um, that the uh, Western Europe and the United States wanted an inroad into all the Arab countries, and the way to get the inroad was to have the Jewish state. Let's, okay. take, let's, take, Tom, let's take the all three questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, then, and then you can answer them all. Is yeah, this isn't really a question, more of a comment, but I think that we should really be problematizing the notion that Israel is somehow pulling the strings to get America to do what it wants, when in fact the reason why America does so many things that Israel wants is because American interests and Israeli interests are, are fundamentally compatible in so many areas. Mm -hmm. It's not that Israel had, it's not like there's some shady cabal of of Zionists who go up to the presidents and say, "Okay, you're going to do this, this, and this." No, it's just that. Um, I mean, it's just that. Basically, I would put it as. Uh, okay, so Israeli um, interests are are paled in parallel to American interests, but that doesn't mean that they always intersect. So, I mean, for example, in 2011, 2012, there was a lot of pressure. Uh, to, uh, to bomb Iran's uh, nuclear capabilities, and the U.S. ultimately decided against that, which I feel is um, evidence that, that it's, it's not really 
the end all be all. Really, at the end of the day, it's it's America, it's Israel that is dependent on America, and not vice versa. Let's have one other hand. Um, anybody else? Okay, okay. Yes. So we all discuss why America supports Israel. I'm I'm still in in 1917. And if it puzzles you why America supports Israel, I can't understand the Balfour Declaration until today. <laughs> and, and I would really, I would really, I mean, we know that these guys were religious, and you know the Jews will be better in Palestine than the Arab. They, you know, they speak like us, they look like us. It doesn't explain the Jews were so. I don't understand the Balfour Declaration. That was very hard to get. Uh, because most of the stockpile was destroyed in the Blitz. Uh, that was just now republished called Palestine the Reality by a man named Jeffries. It's now been, been republished. Um, by your publisher? That's right, yes. I'm by sure, Olive Branch, which published this book. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I think, Jeffries. Uh, I'm sure if you go to Amazon, it'll be right available now. Uh, that's required reading for why the Balfour Declaration. But wh what, we, what we know is that the British probably saw it as a surrogate empire builder. And there was something, I, I have to be very careful the way I say this because it can be twisted to mean other things. There was something going on to do with Britain, World War I, the, Zion, and the Zionists, and the United States. There was something going on. What that was, I've never found any clarity on. But if you go to British cabinet records, uh, pe uh, people like Edwin Montague, a, a very anti-Zionist uh, Jewish member of parliament, he's complaining that here we are in the middle of, of the... He's actually cabinet in the cabinet. Cabinet, I'm sorry, cabinet. Cabinet minister. Cabinet. Uh, he, here we are in the middle of, of the war, of the Great War, World War I, and why is my government so worried about the Zionists? They, they tell it has something to do with, with the United States and the war, but it doesn't make any sense to me. So there was something going on. But uh, this is sometimes interpreted as, as some quid pro quo with the United States and the war. But the, the United States was already in the war before, uh, no. before no, the Balfour Declaration. After the Balfour. After? Yeah. I thought they. I thought the U.S. entered sort of the spring of seventeen. No. Later. Later. The Balfour Declaration is November. Let me let me let me speak to both of these things because these are these are these are uh, constant questions. Um, I would say in both cases, the, the, the reasoning is strategic primarily, and in the case of the United States also secondarily economic. Um, but the British decided they wanted Palestine before they lighted on the Zionist movement as a means to control Palestine. Before World War I, the British had a huge strategic problem with the defense of Egypt from the east. I actually, my first book is on this topic. It has nothing to do with the Balfour Declaration, but it's why the British had determined before World War I that they must control Palestine. And the Zionist movement was just a means to that. It had nothing to do with the brown eyes of the Jewish people. It had entirely to do with British strategic interests. That was the be-all and the end-all of it. Now, there were multiple additional factors. There were personal factors. There was anti-Semitism. Balfour had been prime minister in a conservative government that had issued the Alien Acts that prevented Jews from coming to England. The, one of the most anti-Semitic pieces of British legislation. The, the, the aliens being kept out were Eastern European Jews being persecuted in the pogroms in Russia and elsewhere. So there's an anti-Semitic as well as a philo-Semitic motivation, but I, I would argue that those are secondary. The only other important motivation was to get Russia, to keep Russia, and to bring America in, and to keep uh, Russia in the war. For the, for the British, this was a vital strategic purpose. They were, they were in a desperate situation by 1917, and they knew it, and the deliberations over the Balfour Declaration go back. And for that, you need to oh. Pardon me? And for that, you need to give Palestine. Because there was an assumption that the Zionist movement had enormous influence in Russia and enormous influence in the United States. They were wrong. But if you read the cabinet documents, which you actually have done, and as Jeffries has done, it's clear that that was one of the things the Zionist movement told people in London. We will help you keep Russia in the war. We will help you bring America into the war. We have access through so-and-so and so-and-so and so and so to President Wilson. We have access to the Mensheviks. We have access and so-and-so. And so. But the key thing, though, was the strategic decision. And as far as the United States is concerned, I actually agree with you. Um, there are parallel interests. The Pentagon, uh, uh, what's her name? Um, our friend, Irene Genzier, has written a book, Dying to Forget, in which she comes up with the revelation that the Pentagon shifted its, its views on Israel very soon into the, first, uh, uh, into the 1948 war. 
they realize, oh my God, this is a strategic asset, this country. This is a military power. And so from the very beginning, even though you're right about Eisenhower, Eisenhower pushed back multiple times, not just Suez, again and again. The Eisenhower administration funded anti-Zionist groups in this country. Alan Dulles and the CIA funded Elmer Berger, funded all kinds of people who were working to try and oppose Zionism. Because the, the administration uh, didn't see things in an entirely pro-Israel way. But there were major, major, major strategic interests which were seen as consonant with Israel. And that increased over time. Uh, you, you, and the proof of it, that, that it's American strategic interests, uh, is what has happened multiple times when American strategic interests went against those of Israel. Selling F-15s to Saudi Arabia. Selling AWACS to Saudi Arabia. The first Sinai disengagement agreement. The second Sinai disengagement agreement. The Syrian disengagement agreement. The Cap David Accords. In every one of those cases, when American strategic in interests dictated that Israel be forced to do something, American policymakers had no compunction in forcing them to do it. Where did they not do that? Where Palestine was concerned. Because there's no countervailing pressure. You have the entire arms industry. You have the entire oil industry. You have all the strategic planners saying, we must have the Soviet Union out of the Middle East. That means winning Egypt. That means we have to end the Egyptian-Israeli conflict. Who is pitching for the Palestinians? Nobody. Essentially, you have no, so the, the Israel lobby is one of a dozen factors, or eight or 10 factors. Uh, and not, by, in my view, the most important. It's an important one in certain, in certain respects. The key thing is what, exactly as you said. There are parallel interests. There is one exception. Mm -hmm. This is Dimona. The nuclear, yep. uh, Israel's nuclear power. Israelis and snookered the Americans. The U.S. didn't like it yep. and was powerless. Kennedy well. was furious. If Kennedy had stayed in office, if Kennedy had stayed, had stayed in office, you might have seen a different outcome. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson was a naive, starry-eyed Zionist, and he didn't know anything. Uh, Kennedy had been in Palestine in 1940. He wrote a letter to his father, which is absolute, who's at that point British ambassador to, a U.S. ambassador to the United Kingdom in which he describes Zionism and Palestine and the situation in remarkably perceptive terms. He was no fool. He understood a lot about the situation in the Middle East. You know, he was a, he was a young, callow, a young, callow young man, but he had actually seen the world. He'd seen the South Pacific, where he'd served in the military. He'd seen Europe, where his father was ambassador. He'd been to Palestine. He'd actually visited the country. And he was not about to be snookered by the Israelis in the way that Johnson, who never went anywhere, he knew nothing of the world. He was a domestic, a, a master politician, but he, you know, there the lobby had a huge influence. Mm -hmm. And his, his reported girlfriend, who was a, a former Irgun agent, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, join me in thanking Tom Suarez, please. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to